Whatever we upload, I'm fully leaning on him. So if the video is God tier, it's because of him. If the video is the worst, it's also because of him. This is Dan Mace, and he is the only person Mr. Beast trusts to make his most cinematic videos. If you listen very carefully, you will start to hear a key come in mm -hmm. and we then will move into a diegetic that we've recorded of women singing. And save the place that they call home. That is so cool, oh, bro. So Was there any moment where you were working on an edit, you disagreed with Jimmy? We've never actually once had a debate about anything. Mm -hmm. He lets me be with my filmmaking stuff. Mm. He goes like, if you like that part, keep it. <laughs> <laughs> but Dan had to train his voice and vision by working with YouTube's biggest creator before Mr. Beast, Casey Neistat. This is Dan, by the way. Dan is like a creative genius partner in crime. He is brutally honest, mm -hmm. you know? That taught me how to swallow my ego. In this interview, Dan teaches us how he's elevating Mr. Beast videos to a cinematic level. I don't know what to say. Thank we you. score Thank everything. You. So any Beast Land we film you've watched, this has all been scored by us. No yes. way. Wow. Yeah, we go huge, bro. No. Huge. Huge. Uh, only the big budgets you know, <laughs> do that. That little moment where it's like, Jimmy is talking, and then there's a beat of silence, and then we kind of hear the kids playing. Because it would severely impact the lives of hundreds of children. But the clock Here is the story. And then like, here's the people that we're doing it for. And so like, let's take Jimmy away for a second. And it's just for a split moment, focus on the kids. We always shoot everything at 60. What happens is he like, I'll be like, walk down this thing and he's just like walking. I'm like, look up. But when we slow it down, it, it seems like he's very concerned about whatever. <laughs> so he's just looking there and then we can place something there. I mean, he can be looking down and we can place someone there or something. You could essentially put his stuff on Netflix and we wouldn't know the difference. The best films that we make, is the ones we find that place in the middle. What we want to express in artists, what the audiences want to watch, find that place in the middle. And I think that is the perfect YouTube video in my opinion. To get these kids the same opportunity and basic necessities that me and you take for granted. And save the place that they call home. Beast Philanthropy was a, was a really great channel. And then out of nowhere, this really cinematic, like, fuck you, great filmmaking just like came out of nowhere on that channel. That was you coming on the first time in the Beast Philanthropy video. I wanna know, how did you make that video? Well, they phoned and, and said, um, do you wanna do one video for us? Hello. Yeah, dude. Me and you haven't really catched up since that South Africa trip. And uh, I'm really, really excited to see what the f happens if we let you just take the leads out of video. And with the chance that that philanthropy video would then turn into longevity of the chief creative officer of philanthropy. So I worked really fucking hard <laughs> to make sure that, like, that it was good. And it's ticking and we need to act fast to get these kids the Just the subtle animations. I mean, looking at these ones now, they're really shit in comparison to where we kind of getting now. It's very simple, like the papery textures. Yeah. Um, I wanted to combine the two mm. worlds. You'll just see like the paper fold overlays. There are 153 million orphans globally. This is the first thing we did that I sent to Jimmy. Electricity, water, or toilets. It's a great way of uh, visualizing the problem. You can do like, there are 20 million people doing this and you can like throw in a number and it's like, we don't pay attention to those numbers anymore. For here, it's kind of just, helping me understand the problem because on such a grand scale and I'm bringing it back down to simple concepts. Asbestos was used to build the roofs of the Bapumalele orphanage because it's highly fire resistant and really affordable. The animatics, like, they kind of help really easily explain something without going to shitty stock footage. Mm. Yeah, You don't care. So th that sort of stuff we try and do really quickly. It's been made illegal as it's highly toxic and exposure to these chemicals just through a simple breath can cause cancer and many other health problems. With the visuals, what's motivating these motion graphics, basically? It's describing asbestos, describing- So boring. It's so boring stuff. And so it is, you have to make 
me want to give a shit about asbestos and yeah, it's like yeah. the style and aesthetic of that and basic necessities that me and you take for granted uh, this is this is quite interesting so there we're holding the same key and now but you can if if you listen very carefully you will start to hear a key come in mm. and we then will move into the, a diegetic that we've recorded of women singing mm. and then we turn that into the song and save the place that they call home that is so cool, oh, bro. That is off. so sick. We tease it because like with with the B stuff, you can't be too clever. You, <laughs> no, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, we know like exactly what you mean. That's yeah. why we're laughing. All those sounds there are, are diegetics. I mean, like that's been a common thread through all my work, really. Mm. You can put in all of that B-roll, you can throw in a track, yeah. but again, and then, and then normally they'll like just tend to mute it. But then you throwing in that diegetic sound. Typical effect, it's now dragging me through the camera. It's like I now feel like present a lot more there. The road noise in the background, just throwing yeah, that underneath, already just adds so much more mm -hmm. detail. Suddenly I feel a lot more present in this. Yeah. Mm. To make the world a better place, we will be supporting orphanages all around the world. Mm. We're kicking off this mission in Kailicha, South Africa, where we found an orphanage that needs our help immediately or faces the chance of getting shut and down. And now, which we can mm -hmm. that is the same track that comes in here. Basic necessities that me and you take for granted and save the place that they call home. We've gone from the high in the beginning because of what Jimmy's saying that, like, you know, we, we've clicked on what we know we're going to save an orphanage and that's, that's what we promised to the audience. You want to showcase this environment as some, something that needs to be preserved. It's not something that needs to be grown and nurtured and it's beautiful. So that's why we use diegetics. We invite mm. you into the environment. Mm. We invite you into those women singing and you feel like this, this is a, a safe place place and it's also some you know a place that we feel a part of and now we're giving them a reason to care so we immediately pull, pull you down into what our motif is which is sad mm. the song sad and it's unresolved it's unfinished every day is a struggle every day it's a fundraising we don't have food we don't have we score all our own music as well mm. it's like a big that, that's the main part of wow. like I, I feel like that's 50 percent of these videos i don't know what to say Thank we you. score Thanks. everything. So any Beast for Land we film you've watched, this has all been scored by us. I played a, a piece um, of music and we added some beautiful B-roll of Mama Rosie, the, the main character, and then Darren with like a kid on, on, on his head. And... So we record all of this. Like we bring in people to record. No this. way. Wow. Yeah, we go huge, bro. No. <laughs> Uh, only the big budgets, you know, <laughs> do that. We've got you hooked. Yeah. You know, same four chords, you used to it, you've probably fallen in love. To That's just in a different <laughs> key. You've helped me so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. You. I hate it when it's soundtrack overpass. Like, if anybody looks at it and they go, like, that was a great fucking song you used in your video, you have failed. They've been distracted from the actual content. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the, so the crazy. music should it's so fuel true. the emotion. It should make you really feel something. You shouldn't understand that you're crying because this, the song's mm. sad. Mm. We go like so deep into music. Like we should make a Spotify thing if you guys are going like this hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great creative challenge because I have to constantly utilizing what would be used in the traditional world, which is motifs and music. Mm. The scene seems boring, so what do we do to like bring a part of that forwards? And that's what's happening in Wells now with this this video that we we doing where there's no script. Mm -hmm. I think maybe you would have dealt with exactly the same thing in Blind, right? Yeah, like, they gave me the footage and went go. I was like, all right. I'll enter like a a problem in the film, and it's every single time it's solved with a soundtrack. And if you make the your own soundtrack, it's going to be. 20 million times better than your mind adapting to something that you found on, you look on a stock site and you're like, ah, oh, that's kind of right. Mm. Yeah. You never find something perfect. No. Never. Find something you like, and then I'll adapt the piece to that and you'll convince yourself that emotively like that's right and mm. it feels good. That's true. Hi everyone, good to see you. On this podcast, we talk a lot about how to build and maintain your business as a creative. And no matter how experienced you may be in your creative journey, it's always a fantastic idea 
to continue learning and getting better. And if you're trying to get better at anything that has to do with creativity, that's where Skillshare comes in. Skillshare is the largest learning community in the world with thousands of classes with stackable lessons so you can learn at your own pace in between jobs. I personally get bored really easily, so I'm always trying to work on something new. So I recently just started a new channel called Jordan Clay, which is a cinematic storytelling passion project of mine. Though I have a new channel, I'm still working on my old music video channel and this podcast, and it's it's a lot to juggle. So I've been diving into creative productivity classes with industry pros like Thomas Frank and Ali Abdal to get my life a little more organized. Right now, Thomas is teaching me about tracking, reviewing, and reflections in order to help me make the best creative decisions I possibly can as I move forward in all my businesses. So if you're looking to start a business, a creative journey, or just sharpen your skills a little bit, check out the link in the description. The first 500 people that click that link below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Thanks Skillshare. There's some weird shit with new age editors where they pick a song first. Yeah. And they just choppity chop chop. There's yeah. no story, bro. You think about like this and you're like, oh yeah, man. I mean, oh, Look how great of like an editor I am. You know, and it's, it's like, I just, what the fuck did I just watch, you know? <laughs> A lot of editors would probably, they get the scene, they go for the photo, they don't really know what to do. They go onto a stock website. I find a, a, a track that can work, they throw that in, but then they start editing to the song. Yeah. And then the song becomes a priority. The song then becomes like how the story is told. Whereas for you, it's like, I get the story first with the footage and then I'm going to make the song work with my edit. Yeah, they intertwine. Yeah. Where we found an orphanage that needs our help immediately. Needs our help immediately. You've heard that once now already, like around the 15 second mark, right? So urgency. Faces the chance of getting shut down. Shut down, another emergency. Because it would severely impact severely. Of hundreds of children. Your B-roll is literal B-roll. It's like, what are you saying? Let's showcase it. Yeah, and then it's, so we need to act fast. But the clock is ticking and we need to act fast to get these kids the same opportunity. For me, the, that little moment where it's like, Jimmy is talking, and then there's a beat of silence, and then we kind of hear the kids playing. Because it would severely impact the lives of hundreds of children. But the Here is the story, and then like here's the people that we're doing it for. And so like, let's take Jimmy away for a second, and it's just for a split moment, focus on the kids. Yeah. This is what we're doing this for. This is how much, this is how much fun we're having. This is great. We want to give more to them. And we're uh, about to lose this. Like yeah. this is about to get That's shut all down. all about urgency. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we go back into introducing Kailiche, which is the township in where the orphanage is. There was a kid left on her doorstep and if it wasn't for her, 5,000 kids would be dead, mm. right? They started back then, I saved more than 5,330 children. Those children would be dead. And that that's another really kind of poignant part and what holds you into the the understanding of how, how important what it is that she's done in her community. The health and safety department has deemed the orphanage unfit to house these orphans and threatening to close it down. And then the tone dropped. Close it down. Let us digest that moment. Threatening to close it down. And boom, I get it. Done. I would have made it so much quicker now, but back then, yeah, that seemed cool. And it breaks my heart knowing that they are starting out. This was your first video with him. You've worked with him for so many years. And so you've picked up on just the tiny moments that can be trimmed out that can just uh, increasing just the pacing and then making sure the, the information is a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. That works as it is, but just trimming out those little bits for, let's just say, the YouTube language. It keeps up that pace and the information is just delivered so much more efficiently. Every day is a struggle. Every day it's a fundraising. We don't have food. We don't have electricity, but we keep on. This is my favorite mm. shot in the whole thing. Someone who will come to our rescue. Like this philanthropy. Boom. There it is. Hit. Amazing. I want them to have an opportunity to have a future where they're not going to be plagued by health problems and conditions like that. And I think talk us through the fact that we're now getting it from his perspective. Talk I'm us through sure. like like he's now giving this information. Yeah, so because when we came on to Beast Philanthropy in the beginning, Darren's technically the supporting character to Jimmy, but he's the core character of Beast Philanthropy. This is Darren, executive chief of everything Beast Philanthropy, right? Most days I pretend to be. Darren is a perfect person to play this character and he, he tells the story a completely different way. And he says that I called him average and Agni, which I definitely <laughs> did. I didn't do that. I just said you are perfectly average. <laughs> no, no, but that, that is like, yeah. it, with no hard feelings. Like yeah. he, and he'll laugh at that. But Darren is 
purely the words that he's delivering and his emotion, it feels real. Mm. He hasn't been, there's no makeup on him. We use his awkwardness to look as concern. Mm. So we always shoot everything at 60. What happens is he like, I'll be like walk down this thing and he's just like walking. I'm like, look up. But when we slow it down, it, it seems like he's very concerned about whatever. <laughs> so he's just looking there and then we can place something there. I mean, he can be looking down we can place someone there or something. It's like, you're capturing so many stories, you kind of get what you're needing, but you're kind of then going through all of these B-roll shots afterwards. And essentially you're just like, hey, Darren, just wander around the place. I'll get a couple 60 FPS shots and we can now use this to help kind of motivate your story. Things just being slightly or different from like how we normally perceive things, slowing things down. It kind of gives all this footage just a different feeling. You have helped me so, so much. Thank you, thank you. You. You're bookending it. I love my bookend storytelling. Yeah, except we have to brand read now, so. Oh, yeah. The sponsor of this video. <laughs> <laughs> me understanding Jimmy's uh, editing language, where it is like every cut has to give me another good reason to stay. It has to escalate something. It has to inform me of something. It has to give me something to look forward to that's going to happen later in the video. It's going to have to make sure there's a joke. And if there's not enough Jimmy in, if you don't see Jimmy for five seconds, people are going to drop off. It's like, how are you also in trying to find, understand that balance of what you want to create versus what the audiences are willing to watch? So please click the donate button below the video. Jimmy's the main reason people are coming there to watch mm -hmm. and you have to make them stay. These are beast philanthropy videos. People expect to to understand, to see, and have the beast flow. It's mm -hmm. got his face on the thumbnail, and mm -hmm. we've got a title that's that's quite clickbait. And off they go into the film, and now we suddenly throw down some cinematic shit. People are going to be like, "Nah, fuck this, I'm out," you know. Mm -hmm. Or this is not actually got anything to do with the channel in the first place. In the original cut, because of how much work this is, mm -hmm. this was like twenty seconds long, and Jimmy was like. <laughs> cut it down mm. you know what I mean like yeah. people don't like you guys would care yeah you editors care. and stuff yeah. but the viewer doesn't really care as much so it's a sad truth you know like us as filmmakers we want it to be like the best thing that we can we want to show as much as we can but the viewers don't care about our effort as much as we do it's yeah really it's all really about really abandonment bro. Yeah. how much of your creativity are you willing to abandon to get more views understanding how how frictionless it is to stop watching a video and how we have to like actively consider every single frame has to be a good reason to be staying. Mm. And that's Jimmy's philosophy. This scene needs to go because it's not, it's not, it's, it doesn't inform enough. But for me as the artist, I'm like, no, I love that scene, but I do understand Jimmy's perspective of like, mm. we will lose 20% of our audiences if mm. we keep this scene. Yeah. This is a one billion dollar super yacht. And one of the reasons why his videos are getting millions of views, hundreds of millions now, because he's understanding broad audiences. Not us as artists, what a broad audience is interested in watching. And you're right, they don't care about how great our filmmaking is. We do. And so we go, that's fucking great. But as I said, Josh from South Carolina, South Carolina doesn't care. Like, okay, this is a cool tangent. It's not contributing to the narrative. This is be a, okay, this shot's gonna give you a great opportunity for a big cinematic music cue. I would love that as a filmmaker, but Josh over in South Carolina doesn't <laughs> give a shit. It's the balance of us filmmakers, what we want to show versus where the audiences will actually give a shit about. Right. We post it on YouTube, we get the retention graph, mm -hmm. and it's millions of more points of information to determine That's whether right, it's working yeah. or not. But then also, I am also push pull in that opinion because I think some a lot of data is often misinterpreted. And a lot of and a lot of feedback is often uh, makes us overcorrect, and then we do sacrifice a lot more of our creativity to cater towards what our audiences want, and we sacrifice a lot of that. I think you, you talk about abandoning a lot of what we want. Mm. I do think there's a limit of like otherwise you don't enjoy making what you're making anymore. Oh yeah, fuck that, dude. <laughs> For sure. Then yeah, move on. We're still experimenting. I think mm. we're still right at the beginning of that. Starving and are forced to fend for themselves. We did our first eight minute long video about dogs in Thailand recently, and we've seen lesser engagement. I must actually check where it's at now. The graph on the back end of philanthropy is very interesting. We see three pops. Mm. When it goes up eight days later, and at the 19th day, every what? single fucking time. <laughs> it is the weirdest thing. How often do you post on philanthropy right now? We tried to do the 21 day churn, but it's like everything is reliant on and dependent on Jimmy's schedule. And yeah, yeah so there yeah. is, uh, next year we'll be hitting 21 days. We, back, mm. we backlog now by quite a lot. 
I guess on the 14th day, the algorithm decides, okay, I've given it to these people. I'm going to test it out with these people over here. And then it spikes. But surely if it keeps doing that, it's like, well, these people keep engaging. Let me give it to them first. It means that YouTube gets to understand that you post at exactly the same time every 21 days. We've worked out was like the metric. Then you could go to seven days as well, which mm -hmm. Jimmy's kind of trying to get to now, mm -hmm. um, which is just fucking ridiculous. Yeah, that's like, crazy. <laughs> was there any moment where you were working on an edit, you disagreed with Jimmy, and then you kind of came to an agreement. Whatever we upload, I'm fully leaning on him. So if the video is God tier, it's because of him. If the video is the worst, it's also because of him. Small things that Jimmy wants to change in the video, I very easily change those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. At the end of the day, he knows so much more than I do. If that bit he believes didn't work, then mm -hmm. fuck it. Just, I'll take it out. That's my ego. That's my shit. That's my time that I've spent. That's my anger and shit that I would want to be like, fuck you, dude. I tried so hard on this thing. Now you want me to take it out. Thank With you. philanthropy videos, there's a whole different dynamic. There's a world of people. The more views we get, the more money we get, and the more people we get to help, the more we expand and so forth. So. The, the aim at the end of the day and the intention behind the films we were making is to help more people. And if Jimmy's going to give commentary based on video performing higher and getting more views, like I'm going to lean on him for that. So mm. we've never actually once had a debate about anything. Mm. He lets me be with my filmmaking stuff. Mm. He goes like, if you like that part, keep it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's like fluff yeah. moment. Also, I don't know where we found this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of pressure on this shit. Imagine I just make the worst video ever. You're like, what the fuck? You're talking about like swallowing the ego, letting the film go, accepting some bits. So, like, okay, I love this bit, but. Bro, I worked with fucking Casey Neistat. <laughs> oh, Dude, no. that'll harden you up like a motherfucker. Yeah. But he is fucking brutally honest. Mm -hmm. You know, that taught me how to swallow my ego because we would have creative debates. This is Dan, by the way. Dan is like a creative genius partner in crime. Today's the day. I now look back in hindsight and there is without a shadow of a doubt, that was the greatest fucking decision I've ever made was mm -hmm. to work with Casey. It opened up every door. He taught me so much, so many things. We mm -hmm. we now like that was very much working relationship. Then he became a mentor. Now we mm -hmm. best friends. Tuesday. Hey, did you shoot the did you shoot a proper intro yet for Tech Review Tuesday? No. And especially with the daily vlog and stuff, I would add subtle nuance and might better something. But if he said something was wrong, it was definitely wrong. Mm. I'd come off like a big traditional filmmaking. Uh, of, I was a film director and I was rated as one of the top six up and coming film directors in the world. So I, I had this like big head, you know, <laughs> and I'm like swinging this camera around in New York City. Yeah. And I'm like, bro, do you know who I am? No, dog. You thought you were the <laughs> shit. You yeah. thought you were the shit. Like, I'm going to own this city. There was a lot of shit that would go down in the traditional world. And I'd sit in a fucking chair and I'd think I'm great and I'd tell people to go there and do this and big sets and all, all this money. When I'm with Casey, is none of that. Mm. He's fucking throwing cameras at me like <laughs> to catch from the story high building, weaving down Broadway on a the wrong way on a boosted board. <laughs> and he's like, Dan, come on. I can't have fucking <laughs> pizza drones falling out the sky and shit. Like, <laughs> I'm going like, what the fuck, dude? Like, <laughs> this is so crazy. In the air. Pizza, pizza drone. <laughs> pizza drone. I've been thinking about a lot pizza when drone. it's... I'm seeing so many people that like they start uh, misbehaving like very arrogantly in public, or they start <laughs> they dancing just, uh, in misbehaving. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they start ten out of ten. They're like fuck life. Or they're like, <laughs> ten out of ten. They're like I'm king. Oh, even like they start like uh, stopping traffic, dance, doing a TikTok in the middle of the oh, street, yeah, yeah, just like, drawing like, attention to themselves. The they get the views, oh, yeah. and I and I had this really interesting realization where it's like this is your physical self, and you don't care about this version of yourself as much because you care for more for your digital identity. And so they oh, don't, yeah. yeah. And so it's like, hey, I'm going to dance in the middle of the street and I don't give a shit if I get run over because that's fucking content. Anyone watching this can sit here and say that they are not victim to uploading anything on any platform mm. with the intention of, of not getting likes or engagement. Mm. Yeah. 
and not getting upset when they don't, then you're fucking full of shit. <laughs> yeah, so true. Liar. Eat your Instagram page. Everybody is a personal brand. Yep. Yeah. Me and Logan, we're getting 7 million views, posting every single day, 7 million. I remember that shit. 7 million, 8 million, 9 million. It came to a point where I was like, I didn't even think about it anymore. The validation you get and the views going up, there's a certain point where it's just diminishing returns. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah it's, you become desensitized. Yeah, it's the same way, you know, yeah. when you're really, really hungry and you like, you're, like, you're starving and so you eat this and you eat this, you're full. But because you were starving, you keep eating. But then there's a certain point when it's just like, I just feel awful after this. Yeah. And I think that kind of, you get diminishing returns the more you try to fill yourself up. And like, once you didn't get seven or eight million views and that means nothing to you, what does it happen? Do you go, well, now I want 10 million views. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it happens again, it happens yeah, again, yeah, and it yeah. never fucking stops. It won't I, ever. I love that you use that um, food analogy because yeah. I really think it comes down to a basic human need which is to be loved and to be accepted. And people go so many different ways just to find that. Think of what was popular on YouTube three, four years ago. Is any of that stuff still important today? No. no. We've all moved on. Everyone, mm -hmm. the world moves on. We find something new to get excited about. And then if you get fully addicted to that sort of validation, and then one day the world goes, nah, we're not interested anymore. Mm -hmm. If you're not prepared, you fall hard. The only person that can stop YouTubing and come back is Casey. Yeah. But I was speaking about iconography earlier and like he, he was really good with, with the way in which he uses these glasses. Same thing as I was speaking about four chords. Mm. Today's episode in its entirety is going to be about my sunglasses. The reason that four chords are so popular, we've looked at Casey and maybe we've liked one or two or five of his videos and we've identified him with a simple pair of sunglasses. Mm. Now, when he uploads another video and we see those sunglasses, it immediately reminds us of the old stuff and we get nostalgic and we want to watch and it helps his AVD. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliance in a simple pair of sunglasses. I don't think people have spoken about that before. The other thing though with uh, with Casey and yeah, the, the glasses gave, gives the feeling. You see that in the mm -hmm. thumbnail, you get that same feeling every single time. The other thing I think not a lot of people people really realized with KC is the consistency, but not in the consistency of daily vlogging. It was consistency that he delivered every time. It was like every daily vlog, even if it was just him going to the dentist, mm, I knew he would find a way to make that interesting. Yeah. It's like the video ended and we're like, fuck yeah, he went to the dentist. That was <laughs> awesome. Here's a super basic breakdown of a story. And every good story follows this rule. You've got a beginning, you've got a middle, you've got an end. Setup, conflict, Resolution. He always yeah. was able to deliver on a great feeling, like especially with like his soundtrack choices, his uh, like his time lapse shots. Like ma everyone copied the time lapse shots, not really realizing that was just part of just his brand. And a few people just went, <laughs> "Fuck yeah, time lapse shots, let's go!" But no, it was part of just the yeah, feeling usage, that yeah. Casey created, the boosted board shots, and it's just there was a consistency in each of those things. There was like uh, like foundations, things that we can fall back on. I know he's gonna do a montage on a boosted board. I know he's gonna give us an epic drone shot. I know it's going to give us a great soundtrack and that's comforting. Yeah, yeah. And I think, and then so he, he was consistently in uploads, but he was consistent on his quality, consistent on his tone and his feeling and his, and his style and just tone. And that became such a comfortable place for millions of people to tune into every mm. single day. That's it. I know you did some other work too beyond Casey. Like you said, you're coming from traditional yeah. and I think it's that's a unique perspective to have. What what lessons did you learn from there that have successfully translated to the work that you're doing right now? People draw a sand, like a line in the sand. There's mm -hmm. a definitive line between traditional and non-traditional. That's that's fucking bullshit. Even like now, if you look at what's happening with Jimmy, that'll be known as non-traditional, but it's, that's not really the case because everything is really organized. His movement orders, his call sheets, it's the same shit. You, yeah. you could essentially put his stuff on Netflix and we wouldn't know the difference. Just it's on YouTube and it's not on, on another platform. I'll tell you what the most difficult part about this video is. Mm -hmm. is there's no third act. Mm. There's no conclusion. Mm. We came in with an intention. There's no obstacle either. We created a problem, mm. not an obstacle to the intent. The intent was to build an orphanage and we gave you the problem as to why we want mm. to build the orphanage, right? Which is all these kids need help 
and we're going to expand. And that's the very basic. It ends now as Darren begins the journey of building the orphanage. It's months to get to this point. I was like, this film is going to tank based on the fact that it doesn't have an ending. Mm-hmm. Right? It's just these Literally people an, celebrating. It's an act one. It's just yeah, act one. exactly. And then we did the, the, the video to follow up to this, which we had to then find another story to intertwine into that. So this film's become a trilogy now. That Interesting. They did. We found this kid who now works at an airport as a cleaner. Living. He had to become a cleaner at the airport. Living. And has the goals and aspirations of wanting to become a musician. It kills me knowing that I'm doing something that I'm not into. And there is something that I want to do that I really love, but I cannot do We it. pulled him out of his job and we're building him his album. And we're going to work with extreme music and we'll get him to do a fucking huge ass concert. And then you see the kids going and seeing it for the first time. It's interesting. And then you meet Yam Kele, this mm. new guy. And then he goes back and tells the backstory of what the orphanage used to be like. Mm. And now what it's going to do for these new kids. And then we bring him up. So the storytelling intertwines quite nicely with those three. But we can watch the ending of this. Oh, that's beautiful. Also, massive shout out to Dan Bass, who recently joined the Peaceful Anthropy team. He's going to be working on all our videos this year. He's an my amazing guy. Guy. You should go subscribe to him down below. Yes. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> It's taken us months to get to this point, but yes, to the start of a healthier future for the thousands of kids that are going to pass through this orphanage and to the hundreds of thousands of kids that we hope to help around the world over the next few years. We had we did this shot like 25 times. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, he shakes so much that we made a trap song out of the ladder. <laughs> 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 That's nice. But hey, what's really interesting though is like you just talked about how this video was inconclusive. Mm. It like it like it doesn't work. It kind of ends on a kind of a, a relatively muted point. But you talked to then how about you use the light motifs and how, well and just the motifs and help us feel a completed story. Yeah. And so even though yes, like this was like the act one of the story. We have yeah. only just started. You still made us emotionally feel completed at the end of this mm-hmm. just by the fact that you were trickling in the soundtrack, trickling in little like setups here and there. And then of course, with the asbestos uh, being characterized of like, hey, we need to get rid of this. Just that one shot of just lifting up, hey, this mm-hmm. roof is gone, we're gonna replace it. I'm, I already do feel conclusive towards this and, and I now want to be excited to tuning into the next video. And so, yeah, the story ends on a kind of abruptly but I still felt uh, satisfied with the experience that I had. If you, when you watch version two, the second orphanage, we go back to the same motif, but it's it's elevated and it's in a higher key. In South Africa looked like this. And despite having saved more than 5,000 children's lives over time, he was about to get shut down. People oh. that remember this film will be reminded somehow mm. subconsciously that they've felt this before, Mm. but this is something new. Yeah, Yeah. you're you're using emotion and tone to tell the story. I am a little bit envious of the uh, creative freedom that you do have with Beast Philanthropy. And I love the fact that Jimmy trusts you in making these. I sent him that animatic, then into this like emotive thing. And he came back with like a cry face and he was like, can't even remember what he said. He was like, fuck yes or something. So I was like, cool, we're going in the right direction. What up? Jimmy and Darren both didn't want me to watch them watching the film I made for them. But then I got this message from Jimmy. And then Darren sent me this. That is absolutely incredible. I can see why Jimmy loves it so much. You you, you nailed it. You did an absolutely... The best content, the best films, I don't want to say content anymore, the best films that we make is the ones we find that place in the middle. What we want to express as artists, what the audiences want to watch, find that place in the middle. And I think that is the perfect YouTube video in my opinion.